Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Rob Shane. I am the communications manager for Restore America's Estuaries. Uh, I know some of you returners are used to seeing Hillary Stevens at the helm here. She is unfortunately uh, on vacation today. So I will be taking over. Uh, we're super happy to have you here. Join us for today's presentation from Dr. Stacy Baez at the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, but before we get rolling on that, uh, we might give it a few minutes for people to keep rolling in here. I just have a couple of introductory slides, let you know a little bit about Ray, what's going on on our side of the house here as well before we get to Stacy's presentation. So if you give me a quick second, I will go ahead and pull this up and uh, we'll get rolling here. Uh, so again, the presentation for today is uh, seagrass an ally in the fight against climate change? Um, featuring Dr. Stacy Baez of the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, but first, a little bit about Ray. Uh, Restore America's Estuaries is a organization comprised of ten uh, organizations, alliance members across the country. Uh, from Washington State, to California to Florida to Rhode Island. Uh, we are dedicated to the protection and restoration of bays and estuaries as essential resources for our nation. Uh, you can learn more about our group and what we're involved in at our website, www.estuaries.org. Um, one cool thing that we've been working on recently uh, is the Coastal Restoration Toolkit. Uh, this is a program developed by Ray with other partners in the coastal restoration field uh, that really is meant to drive uh, restoration programs for local nonprofits as a, as a guideline of how to get started, uh, common practices, themes, um, ideas, opportunities for funding, permitting, uh, you name it, it's there. You can find more information on that at restoreyourcoast.org. Uh, additionally, on our YouTube channel, we have a handful of videos explaining this, including a recording of last month's webinar uh, hosted by Elsa Schwartz and a few members of our alliance groups. Um, so I encourage you to check that out, and I'll have a link to that YouTube channel here at the end. Um, additionally, we'd like to uh, always highlight one of our biggest events every other year is our national summit. Um, I do, I am happy to announce today that there are details coming out very soon on the 2022 summit. So be sure to check back with us here um, again in the coming days, coming weeks for some more details on that. Uh, additionally, uh, again, on our YouTube channel, you can find recordings of last year's virtual summit, uh, some of the sessions, some of the select sessions that we wanted to highlight for the general public, uh, give you a little bit of a taste of what you can expect next year, uh, but also give you some ideas and, and, and opportunities to kind of form your own programs at home and uh, hear about what other groups in, in the US are doing to uh, protect and restore our coasts. Um, another quick announcement, uh, this year we will be hosting uh, the 2021 Living Shorelines Tech Transfer Workshop in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, for more information on that, go to estuaries.org slash living shorelines. Uh, this is uh, hopefully going to be our first in-person event, uh, though we are still waiting on a few things to clear up. But if you, uh, if you do work in the living shorelines field and you'd like to join us, we do encourage that. Again, we'll have more information on how to register and uh, some of the precautions and guidelines we'll be following in the coming weeks. Um, and last but not least, wanted to uh, give another quick announcement for one of our grant programs that we manage here at Ray, uh, the NEP Coastal Watersheds Grant. Uh, applications for the for the grant program, living uh, sorry, uh, letters of intent are being accepted now. We will be having a another informational webinar on this program on May fifth. Uh, so be sure to check out the link there, estuaries.org slash initiatives slash watershed grants uh, for how you can register and sign up for that and uh, learn more about the grant program, whether or not you may be eligible to apply. Um, 
And as I mentioned, for all of our upcoming events and announcements, we do encourage you to follow along with us on social media. Uh, here are a few of our handles, taglines. Um, this is the easiest way, best way to learn about future webinars, grant announcements, uh, funding opportunities, partnership opportunities, and just generally, uh, you know, good stories that we think are important to the coastal restoration community. Uh, so we encourage, please do give us a follow, like our pages, check out some of those videos. Uh, we have a whole library of recordings from previous webinars. Uh, like I mentioned, the summit events and other events on our YouTube channel. So please do check that out. Um, without further ado, I am happy to introduce Dr. Stacy Baez from the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, Dr. Baez is an officer with the Coastal Wetlands and Coral Reefs Project at Pew. Uh, she supports countries in developing a scientific framework needed to ensure strong protections for coastal wetlands and coral reefs. Uh, Stacy has worked on science initiatives to support the creation of large, fully protected marine areas worldwide, and she has worked to establish Caribbean shark sanctuaries. Uh, before joining Pew, uh, Dr. Baez conducted small-scale fisheries assessments in the Philippines, uh, and I recently learned she's done some work in the Chesapeake Bay as well. Uh, she has a, bachelor, a bachelor's degree in biology from Morgan State University and her doctorate in oceanography from Old Dominion. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Stacy. And uh, I do encourage you, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type them into the questions box. We will get to as many as we can at the end. Um, you are all muted for the time being. Um, but, uh, but please do please do type your questions in and then we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, otherwise, Stacy, thank you so much for joining us and I will go ahead and disappear into the background here and uh, pass everything over to you. Thank you, Rob. Um, can you see that PowerPoint, Rob? Yes, it looks yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. It's a lot of stuff on my screen. Just want to clear it off a little. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, major thanks to Ray for having me on today, particularly Hillary and Rob. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, as Rob mentioned, I work for Pew and um, I work on a project to support coastal wetland protection as well as coral reefs. And these uh, coastal wetland protections are seen as a nature-based solution in the fight against climate change. And typically when we think of a nature-based solution, our mind wanders off to a forest, and unrightfully so. But today, uh, during this webinar, I hope when you hear the term nature-based solution, you also think of seagrass. Um, I know many of you are US-based, um, and so I'm going to give a global perspective of seagrass, stepping away from the US to think more globally about this ecosystem. And then we'll come down to one of our projects in Seychelles. So it's a very interesting research project, mapping seagrasses and uh, developing a carbon estimate for seagrasses in country. So before I dive into seagrass, I just wanted to mention that um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has three marine ecosystems that they recognize for its measurable contribution towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and just to remind everyone, the overarching goal of the Paris Agreement is to keep global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius, ideally no more than 1.5. And so countries can put forward um, protection and restoration of mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. These three ecosystems, and you'll hear me say coastal wetlands, I, I mean these three uh, when I say coastal wetlands, um, have approved methodologies by the IPCC for estimating carbon storage and, and sequestration rates. And so they can be put forward um, in an inventory. And I know many of you might be familiar with this um, infographic. It's from the Blue Carbon Initiative, but there's many versions of it. And I just wanted to show very briefly 
when compared to terrestrial forests, which are the boreal and tropical forests, um, the two bands above, mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows hold disproportionately more carbon per equivalent unit area than terrestrial forests. And it's because these systems are coastal. They're typically called blue carbon ecosystems because of their coastal nature. They're often inundated or submerged like seagrass. And that low oxygen, salty water, you know, that anoxic environment slows the decay of debris and litter and other organic matter. So these ecosystems accumulate really rich organic soils. And that carbon that rests in the soils can remain there for millennia if these ecosystems are left undisturbed. So it's, it's critical to think about them, not just for the adaptation benefits to climate, but also in terms of like holding carbon in place, because when these ecosystems are lost, that carbon that was once previously there and may have been there for decades is now um, oxidized. It goes back out as carbon dioxide, along with things like methane and nitrous oxide. So instead of the ecosystem drawing down um, carbon, it now in turn emits. So we want to protect and restore um, as much of these very important places as we can. So I'm going to dive into seagrass. And if we were in person, I would have done this quiz and it would have been a lot of fun. Um, but since we're virtually, and I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, which could be a little bit of a bore, um, I thought it might be fun still to do this quiz. And uh, I have no technical capacity for the, the Zoom polls. I've been on webinars, and we have breakout rooms and Zoom polls. And so it's just going to be in your head. Um, so stepping away from the US for a minute, how many countries contain seagrass? And I'll give you two seconds to think about that. Is it 191 countries, 159, or 138? So the answer is B, 159 countries. Seagrasses are found everywhere, six continents except the Antarctic. Um, so we know that seagrasses are, are everywhere. So how much of it do we have? And this is a, a crucial question because it's one of the issues with seagrass in terms of putting them forward for management and conservation. I'll give you one second to think about it. Most people will say it's B, 300,000 kilometers squared. So our best estimate of the seagrass extent globally is 300,000 kilometers squared. But that estimate ranges between, so some people will say 177,000, and then others will say 600,000. So it really just depends on who you ask um, how much seagrass there is globally. But most people will go with B. And then now we know seagrasses are everywhere. There could be a lot of it. Since we've started recording it, how much has been lost? And this, this is an interesting but also sad question. Um, I think everyone on this webinar probably knows it's estimated that we've lost about 30% of our seagrass meadows. So just to recap the, the kind of global picture, um, there's 159 countries. If you have a coastline, you probably have seagrass in, that, in those waters. Um, global estimates are around 300,000 kilometers squared, but there is a large variance around that estimate. Um, We've lost about 30% of our seagrass acreage since 1879, which was when like first recording started to come online for seagrasses. And then this one, um, which now is kind of an old stat statistic, but I couldn't find a newer one. Uh, seagrasses are disappearing at a rate of 110 kilometers squared per year, and that's since 1980. Um, again, that's a little bit old. Um, I'm sure there's a new rate out, but I was, unfortunately wasn't able to, f to find it. Point being, we're still losing seagrass. And when we think about seagrasses, adaptation naturally comes to mind. I mean, they are critical. I don't have to tell anyone how critical they are for fisheries. Um, one fifth of the world's largest fisheries depend on seagrass uh, meadows for habitat. It could be nursery habitat or shelter. And when we think largest fisheries, think um, things like cod, 
pollock, large-scale fisheries. Uh, seagrasses are also important for flood defense and storm defense. So seagrass roots and rhizomes hold ocean sediments together, um, improving shoreline stabilization, the canopy for for tall, taller species help reduce wave impacts. Um, and these attributes are going to be very critical because we're expecting the intensification and the frequency of storms uh, to increase as our climate changes. And then the last thing, um, which falls more along the lines of mitigation, and it's if it's one statistic you remember from this talk today, or the only thing you remember from this talk today, is that 10% of the organic carbon uh, sequestered in the ocean is buried in seagrass beds. Some people will even say 18% of all the organic carbon sequestered in the ocean is buried in seagrass beds. But regardless if it's 10 or 18, because of the vast extent of seagrass, it's a globally significant stock of carbon held in seagrass meadows worldwide. And so, Countries can look to um, keeping this carbon intact. They might maybe one day want to include seagrass in an inventory. Um, I'm going to talk about the NDC, the Nationally Determined Contribution, which is a mechanism countries can um, use to include the protection of seagrass um, as part of their commitment to the Paris Agreement. But I just wanted to show um, what it means when we say carbon stored. So the total organic carbon stored in a meadow is calculated by the extent of the ecosystem, the area, times the organic carbon value of a soil uh, sample. So per unit area, and then you scale it up to the full ecosystem extent. And so countries can do this calculation. They may not need the in-situ value of carbon, because the IPCC has solved that for them. There are published proxies that any country can use, um, and they're provided for mangroves, salt marsh, and seagrasses. Um, and then the area, which will lead us along the lines of, well, what do we mean by area? What, how good is our map? Um, but if, if countries, uh, as a first uh, principle, wanted to include something like the carbon stored, um, it's a very simple baseline calculation that they can do, even without an in-situ value of carbon. But some places might want to take it further. Um, so this are, these are two photos from the Seychelles. And in Seychelles, there are about 11 species of seagrass, from the very small leaf Halophila or Halophila, depending on who you talk to, um, on the left, to Inhalus on the right. and um, Inhalus is, is persistent, it has deep uh, rhizomes, it's strong, you know, very persistent seagrass um, versus the short-leafed um, halophila. And the benefits provided to fisheries um, and to carbon storage would vary between these two. So eco ecosystem services vary, because when we say seagrass, it's just not a monolith, it's so many species, I think 72 species worldwide, um, with varying characteristics. So some countries might want to look more deeply into their seagrass um, species and, and more deeply into how much carbon is actually stored there before they put forward um, a, a commitment. And so I know you guys recently had a webinar with uh, Steve Crooks and Emily Pigeon. They by far are the experts on NDCs. I'm going to give you a novice take, um, a simplified version of it. So every country that signed the Paris Agreement will put forward a domestic plan. And these domestic plans just outline the actions that they will take to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And they're country specific. So based on your national circumstance, their own priorities, and their own scientific capacity. So it's country specific. These plans are known as NDCs, Nationally Determined Contributions. Every five years, each country will update their NDC with increasing ambition. So over time, the idea is that the, the, that plan, that NDC, gets stronger and stronger to meet the overarching goal of the agreement. And then lastly, I wanted to say, while this discussion is about seagrass, it's about nature-based solutions to climate, um, 
nature-based solutions is not um, a standalone. It is to complement emission reduction plans. So think about it as, you know, the, the icing on the cake. Nature-based solutions are important to people. They're important to biodiversity. Um, but in of itself, um, we would still need targeted specific emission reductions to, to achieve climate goals. And I wanted to give just a, a quick um, overview. This visual, I think, is really nice. Um, it helped me really understand when I first started learning about the NDCs and the, and the process. So last year, NDCs were due. Uh, but because 2020 was such a crazy year, I mean, countries had their hands full with so many other things that it slowed that NDC process. So countries are still submitting their NDCs, their national plans. Um, so they, they come forward. In 2030, there will be a global stock take. And the global stock take just means that we will look at all these plans and see how well we're progressing towards cu cumulatively reaching this goal. And then 2025, another NDC round. And so every five years the NDCs should increase in ambition and then in between the increments of those five years we look at how well we're progressing and the idea is that by 2050 we have climate resilience and zero net emissions. Um, if you want to learn more um, Pew, along with many other partners, um, developed this NDC guidance document. It's found on the Blue Carbon Initiative's website. So if you just go Blue Carbon Initiative and just search policy guidance, it, it will come up. Um, you know, everything you need to know about the NDCs in a simplified way, um, you could share it with any of the countries that contain a coastal wetlands. So now you know a little bit about the NDCs, you know a little bit about seagrass. How many countries have put forward or mentioned seagrasses as part of their um, commitments? And so we're in 2021. Thus far, there are 12 countries that have put forward uh, or mentioned seagrass in their nationally determined contribution. We have some nice Caribbean countries. So I'm actually originally from the Caribbean, so I love to see when Caribbean countries are pushing the needle on conservation, Bahamas, St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, unsurprisingly, there are some big ocean country, Kiribati, uh, Mauritius, you know, large EEZs. Um, but thus far, none have put forward a target towards seagrass. So seagrass has been mentioned. Um, towards either adaptation or, or potentially mitigation, but um, the, no country has put forward um, a specific target. So we're waiting to see as more NDCs come in. Actually, Cabo Verde um, came in like last week or the week before, I don't remember. So, so things are coming in slowly. Um, and so it, it's just growing momentum, you know, there's building momentum across the globe looking at these nature-based solutions and now seagrass is coming in whereas predominantly before you would see maybe more mangroves maybe more terrestrial forests so there's growing momentum oh and this image is from the unep's doc out of the blue that came out last year if you've not had a minute to look at it i would encourage you to do so because it's a very nice overview of seagrass not just from the ndc perspective but like mapping and monitoring. So it's really nice, um, a nice synthesis. So why has it been so slow for seagrass to like get online compared to mangroves um, in terms of it getting them into not just climate policies, but just sometimes even just basic management policies. And it's because of our global seagrass map. Um, many countries will, will say, oh, you know, I don't know how much seagrass I have. And it's because the methods we use to map seagrasses vary. Sometimes they're extremely costly. And uh, for example, the output from a mapping exercise that used a drone, which is the image on the left, will be very different from a mapping exercise that used Landsat, which is the image on the right. And so the resolution of these images are, are different. Um, higher resolution imagery 
it's, it's clearer, you don't have to unmask so much, you don't have to mask for atmospheric conditions and, and oceanographic conditions in the same way that you might have to for Landsat. Um, and so there's this spectrum of, of uh, remote sensing, remote sensors on satellites that, that are available, but I will say in the past 10 years, satellite imagery accessibility has improved, um, it's less costly, and there's also new technologies using cloud computing that didn't even exist maybe six, seven years ago um, on these cloud computing platforms that make it efficient to do large-scale mapping with high accuracy, with good accuracy. Um, so looking forward, hopefully, you know, in the next in the next decade, our global seagrass map improves um, for parts of the US, for the Mediterranean, and ma the map is actually quite good. Um, but then when you look at the Caribbean, you look at insular Asia, East Africa, Indian Ocean, I mean, it's just not, just not enough uh, data in those places. So improving this map, will really help move the needle on seagrass con conservation. And, and you know, and the data here is not bad data. I don't want to say, make it seem like I'm, I'm being too discouraging. You know, it's, it's, it's information that's important. It's just that we've used so many different methodologies and it's a, an amalgamation of so many projects that have operated on different timelines and could be, excellent like high quality mapping with validation really expensive projects alongside projects that might be more um qualitative you know anecdotal so it's just moving the needle not necessarily globally but in the areas around the equatorial region where there's a lot of seagrass and a lack of data So that's kind of the, the big um, overview of, of seagrass and where we stand globally. But I wanted to take you down to Seychelles, where we have a project to map uh, Seychelles seagrass um, and then help develop an estimate for the carbon stored in seagrass meadows. And I'm going to show you a, a map of the archipelago, but I wanted to start here in De Roche. Dirosh um, has about 100 people living on it, and every dark patch is a seagrass meadow. And anecdotally, I, I've never been there. Um, you know, people have said that the seagrass meadows extend for miles because it's shallow and it's clear, and there's only 100 people living on this island, so the, the, the impacts are quite low. And Seychelles is interesting, you know, ecologically, it's in the middle of the Indian Ocean. There's like tortoises and really interesting species of seagrass and birds. Um, it's also culturally interesting. And so there is a conservation ethic that really filters across um, policies that's, I don't know, I feel um, very inspiring. And so here we are. and. We're just off of Mauritius. Well, you can't see Mauritius. We're we're off of Madagascar, and if you could see my pointer, this is not the full island uh, chain, but these three islands, Mahe, Pralin, and Ladique, are referred to as the inner islands, and this is where the majority of the Seychelles population live. So something like 90% of the people live on these three islands. And going back to that picture of De Roche, uh, these are just like some examples of, of seagrass meadows in Seychelles. And these photos are from um, Dr. Jean Mortimer. She is a turtle researcher and um, she, studying turtles and inevitably, you know, she followed some turtles to Seychelles and she lives there now and as a turtle researcher or anyone who um, studies a species that rely on seagrass for food or habitat, you end up being an expert in seagrasses. And so I just wanted to show a couple different pictures. These are Thalassodendron uh, mainly, but the photo in the lower left is in Halas and they get really long leaves 
much longer than any any species I had seen before. So it's just really interesting and they're densely packed um, seagrass meadows. Even in the inner islands where the majority of the people live and the coastal zone is much more impacted than a place like De Roche, which was that iconic photo I showed, um, you could still stand on a beach and see out and see seagrass meadows. And they're not heavily covered in algae. It's, it's really... Um, it's really beautiful. And because it's Seychelles and because Seychelles is such an ocean leader, I wanted to share this one slide on another cool project unrelated to ours. But in 2019, um, there was this Necton expedition and they had a submersible. And they went down, they took plankton toes and all the things that you do on a research cruise. But the president, the then president of the country went down in the submersible as well. And it was the first time the leader of a country had given a speech underwater. And his talk was a call, a global call to protect our oceans. And Seychelles has protected 30% of their EEZ. And so like they are so um, ocean minded because, you know, we, depend on the ocean. We, and I say we as a Caribbean Islander as well, it's like so integral to the health of our planet and our climate. But I just thought I would share this. And there is a YouTube video. You should go look at it afterwards. It's pretty good. Um, so back to the Seychelles project. So if you remember that calculation of the area and the carbon to get a total carbon estimate. So this project seeks to do that along with um, a validated seagrass map. So it's being led by the University of Oxford in partnership with the University of Seychelles and Island Conservation Society, which is a local um, NGO. Those are the, the research arm um, of this work and there's also a policy arm. So SACAT, which is the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust, is working um, to help move the scientific information into the NDC process. And so information gathered from Oxford and the University of Seychelles and Island Conservation Society will be packaged in a way that's accessible to policymakers and it will flow towards the NDC. So it's a direct tie um, of a direct link of science informing policy, which is like exactly how policy should be built. And I'm going to go back to the Seychelles map because um, it's such a big EEZ and I wanted to present like the scale of the work. So this is a mapping project where images from satellite will be collected um, and in parallel to that there will be a field validation study to make sure to validate, to train the model um, from the satellite imagery. And then alongside that, while the one crew is out collecting seagrass for validation information, there'll be another crew collecting um, soil cores. So it's a really logistically complex project on a fairly large scale. So the zones one, two, and three are the inner islands where everyone lives. The zone four is where Dayrosh is, that beautiful island I showed you. Um, Five, I'm going to show you some new data from that area. It's called Fakwa, it's many names, and then all the way to seven. And seven, some of you might know, it's Aldalbra Atoll. It's a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has um, 100,000 giant tortoises that live there. There is a research station, but it's, um, my understanding, is it's really tightly controlled. Everything is like very, very rigorous. And so you have to get a series of permits and only a few people go at a time. So this is the, t the scale of the, the research project and seagrass soil cores will be taken across the full EEZ in each of these seven zones. Um, and I wanted to show this, this kind of infographic of the full thing. So like there's a satellite and images will be collected, it'll be analyzed. And at the same time, we have um, the field validation going to inform the model and then the soil cores. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, I don't have any results to share. Um, 
and you know we want to make sure everyone is safe and it's in a good weather window so the University of Oxford will begin its field work and its uh, capacity building and training for the field crew in October of this year which puts us almost 12 months behind but you know it's it's for the best it, it, it we will it will be safer for everyone um and it gives enough time to plan and make sure that things are in place for like field validation and extremely difficult logistics to take place um i just wanted to show uh because i don't have any photos this is from um the blue carbon manual of what seagrass soil coring looks like basically an a frame and um a PVC pipe, a hammer, and some elbow grease. And so you walk away for until you get to one meter, which is standard for, for um, carbon estimates. You pull that uh, PVC pipe up, you dry that core, it's subsampled um, and it's dried in an oven. You, it's subsampled and then it's we're gonna send it off for analysis um, outside the country. So it's like a, a full, um, you know, a full scope project. It has not just the coring, but the University of Oxford will come in and train everyone. So there's a significant amount of cap capacity building at the University of Seychelles and at um, Island Conservation Society as well. So a couple of things have taken place. Um, although we don't have the fieldwork started, SECAT, which is the policy organization and really the driver of this project, convened a seagrass workshop, uh, which seemed like a, a lifetime ago, uh, March 2020. So it's just, just as things were starting to, um, to close down, and they brought together not just the scientists from Oxford and University of Seychelles and, and you know, all this, the scientific community in country that focus, who focus on, on seagrass, but they also convened policymakers, so technical government people, like your, your, the technical leads, the data managers, as well as high level decision makers. And so they all came together in one room and the science it was just so interesting like to see that process because it's so rare to have that cross pollination in the same space you know it, it was just really lovely to see like the policy people and the scientists like have these discussions around seagrass and one of the interesting things that SECAT did was they printed off these very big maps of different zones in the Seychelles and they had people fill in where there was seagrass where there might be loss, um, where there might be um, increasing meadows, what types of seagrass. And they had not just scientists, but they had important stakeholders, like they had a couple of fishermen and uh, sea cucumber divers. And sea cucumber diving is a really like traditional art, I would say, like they go down, it's no tanks, just um, really interesting group. and. You know, some of the sea cucumber divers, their grandfathers had been diving on those same seagrass beds. So anecdotally, they had like a hundred years of seagrass information like in their minds. And so it was just a really interesting process. And no, I, I hadn't been in a process like that to see like that full spectrum. Although I've been a part of many different workshops, you know, in the US and also in the Caribbean, but it was nice to see that flow from just not just the policy and the scientists, but also the wider community. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to present today, so Oxford University, um, the lead researcher, uh, Dr. Gwilym Rolands, uh, sh shared this slide with me. And it just goes to show like how information on seagrass maps vary. So in Farqua, which is one of the, one of the places in Seychelles, um, World Seagrass Atlas, which is the image on the left, says, well, there's no seagrass. And, and below, you'll see no data for region. And then the next image, um, the Outer Islands Mapping Project, which is the Seychelles project uh, in 2005, said there's 53 kilometers of uh, seagrass. And then the Seychelles, which the, so I'm on the third one now, the Seychelles MSP Mapping, the MSP is the marine spatial planning that the country is taking forward to um, 
manage their 30% that they've protected. So they have this huge marine spatial planning project and that's been run by the Nature Conservancy. Um, this is a really nice project because um, it's recent, used good resolution imagery, unfortunately did not have field validation, but it says that Seychelles has 100, and that little area has 106 kilometers. And then lastly, um, the Coral Allen, the Atlas, um, and I, I just want to caveat that Allen Coral Atlas did not go out with the intention of mapping seagrass, but seagrasses tend to be in the same place sometimes as corals, not always, but sometimes. And so they said they had 16 kilometers squared of seagrass. So in this one area, depending on who you ask, depending on the methods, you could have zero to 106 kilometers squared of seagrass. And so it's this challenge of making sure that the seagrass map for Seychelles is um, validated, using the best available approaches today could really move the needle in a country that has extensive seagrass beds. Okay, so that's our research project. And I, and I mentioned that there is a whole policy piece um, moving forward in tandem. And I just wanted to show a couple images because I know we might be coming up on time. Uh, since I don't have research to share, I thought these were just interesting side stories that came about. Um, so SACAT, which is the policy organization um, leading the charge on the ground, had their five-year anniversary. And so the photo on the left is Angelique Poponu. She is the CEO of SACAT. And then on either side of her, two new government ministers. And so you see Save the Seagrass Climate Action. And because of these conversations they were having with policymakers, it ex organically extended to the general public. And so now they've gone out and done a seagrass traveling roadshow. And so they've gone out to dive associations to help identify seagrass to the tour guides. So when the tour guides take people on tours, um, you know, they could see different things in the seagrass meadows. And so it's moved on to the wider community. And as part of that process, they said, well, you know, we should have some Creole words for seagrass because the word gomo, which is the Seychelles Creole word, refers to both algae and seagrass. There's no distinct word for seagrass in a country that has a lot of seagrass. And so now um, they've gone ahead and they're working with the Creole Institute at the university to come up for Creole words for the species that are found in their waters. And so their, their work is super cool. And I'm going to put in a plug for SACAT to follow them on social media because they have like the funniest, most interesting posts. Um, oh, and this is Jean, Jean Mortimer who, um, who kindly shared all the seagrass photos with me to, to share with you guys today. So follow them on social media. It's a great project, um, much cooler than any of my social media, I will just say. And so um, where are we now? Well, NDCs were due in 2020. Countries are still submitting. Seychelles is getting ready to submit their NDC. Um, in fact, last week on the Leader Summit, um, the Minister uh, for Agriculture, Minister Joubeau, uh noted that they're looking towards seagrasses um, as part of their NDC. For the research project, um, Oxford is finalizing sites and methodologies, and there's continued coordination across agencies and institutions in Seychelles. So ultimately, when there is a field validated map and a first time carbon estimate for the country, it flows directly into the policy process, the NDC and, and beyond, also towards management. Um, and then I am just going to conclude. So we we went through today, we looked at seagrass from a global perspective. Hopefully I took you to a beautiful place um, in Seychelles and we're, as we're all still stuck at home, I'm, I'm still at home, um, to see what a, a small island nation is doing to protect their, this critical ecosystem. And I, and I hope um, as you think about seagrass, be it in research or um, otherwise, you, you start thinking of seagrass as a nature-based solution um, in response to climate change. 
And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Awesome, that was so fantastic. And we're so thankful that you were able to join us and, and share your work with us and, and share some of these um, findings with us. I guess, I think maybe the first question that's on everyone's mind and certainly mine, uh, is when do you get to go to the Seychelles and do you need help? Uh, because I know someone who would love to join that trip. Okay, if that person could fit in a suitcase, there's a greater likelihood that they can come. <laughs> uh, we do have some, some serious questions that came in. Um, the first is, is seagrass around every coastline or does it vary based on temperature and climate, uh, specifically in the northern countries, Scandinavia, et cetera? And also, does it vary based on depth? Yeah, uh, the, la the latter is really critical. So seagrass is the maximum depth um, is estimated to be around 90 meters or so. Although in that Necton expedition um, that I showed, in their submersible, anecdotally, they said that the seagrasses were much deeper. Uh, it just really depends on water clarity. I guess the limiting factor is light. Um, and, and things like runoff, pollution, sedimentation, all the things that are not so good for seagrass, but if if in a in a clean environment, um, light is the most important factor. Awesome. Uh, next question: How are measurements of carbon sequestration taken to compare forests to seagrass beds? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the, the sequestration varies across ecosystems. So so seagrasses. Okay, so this is a complicated answer. Seagrasses sequester carbon at different rates depending on species, sediment type, uh, oceanographic, just basic hy hydrology. And so in comparison, seagrasses will sequester much slower. So this is drawdown, I think is what the person means. And much of the seagrass carbon comes from outside sources. So it's not so much just seagrass biomass. It's like there's a difference between the alloctonous carbon, the outside sources and the, the sources from the, the seagrass bed. So to answer that question, sequestration itself is variable, probably slower. But with that said, seagrasses hold a lot of carbon below ground and it remains there for a long time. And so we shouldn't just look to sequestration as seagrass's key value. It's, it, it really is about keeping that carbon in place. Fantastic. Um, I have uh, a couple of notes. Thank you, Dr. Baez. Great and inspiring presentation. Uh, wow, this has been very cool. Um, I agree with that one. Um, this was so insightful and a great little getaway from the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest, so I can appreciate that. Uh, the question is seagrass different than seaweed uh, that this person has seen in San Diego? Seagrasses are very different than seaweed and I'm going to give a little personal story. So I told some relatives, in, I'm, I'm from Trinidad, I told some relatives I was giving this webinar about seagrass and then we were talking about what seagrasses were and they all described algae. To me and i said no seagrasses have roots it's a plant it's a flowering mm -hmm. plant and they and i couldn't convince them imagine <laughs> i'm like what are you talking about who are you going to listen to here and they're like no 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 that's seagrass and i'm like no it's algae um yeah so even in places where there's a lot of seagrass and it should be um you should regular people should know the difference it's like seagrasses have roots rhizomes they're plants they produce flowers algae just have a hole hole fast so they just hold on to attached to rock and for that reason they don't sequester carbon in the same way as seagrass because they just blow off into the ocean or they get eaten and seagrasses are able to hold that sediment together because of the rhizome and the root system and it keeps things in place Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna combine two questions here because they're they're somewhat similar. Uh, 
first, can you talk about the mechanics of seagrass restoration? Uh, and the second is how intense is an activity, how intense of an activity is it to restore? Uh, are we in a place to expand seagrass coverage or are we at best aiming to recover lost areas or hold on to what we've got? That is such an excellent question. And un unfortunately, I may not be the right person to answer it. You know, the US, like in Virginia, they've done an excellent job of seagrass reforestation. Um, sorry, seagrass restoration. But, you know, it's you know, really it's challenging. challenging. That's, yeah, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I can't I can speak to that from my personal from experience. Personal experience. Uh, no, that's perfectly fine. Uh, to those who, who were asking about that, I know we do have some resources on our website about seagrass restoration. Uh, we've done and worked with partners who have been doing uh, restoration in the, in the Chesapeake, certainly in the Gulf and uh, out on the West Coast as well. Uh, so I invite you to check that out at estuaries.org. And I imagine Pew might have some stuff on, on their website about that as well. Um, uh, one other question about uh, about coring. What is your average water depth you are retrieving soil core samples in Seychelles? Yeah, sometimes, well, because we've not done the, the field work as yet, it's going to be 30 meters and shallower, and then there's another team 30 meters and deeper. But I don't know how deep, probably not that much deep. Not I, I, I would have to check and come back to answer that, but I would say 30 meters is probably max. Awesome. And I one last question, um, and this is maybe more of a, uh, you know, an observation that you've seen. Obviously, uh, mapping is a critical tool now for conservation and restoration, um, and, and you're putting it to use, and I know many others are putting it to use. How have you seen or what has been your experience in the success of, of those mapping exercises or, or mapping exercises that you plan to do? and its correlation to uh, policy outcomes or on the ground restoration. Um, how does that kind of that, obviously mapping and, and the geospatial revolution, if you will, has become such a huge part of the science that we conduct. Uh, how have you seen that in the last decade or so since, since that you've been working on this? How have you seen that kind of influence and change the way we do restoration and think about conservation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, mapping approaches have really advanced in the past, like I would even say five years. Now you could do huge complicated calculations on um, Google Earth Engine that you couldn't do before. And so it, it reduces the amount of local capacity that you need to have in country because it can be done like regionally. There's a great project out of the Mediterranean. Um, the scientist is Demo Straganos, and so he uses cloud computing platform, which is the same methods that our project will use, um, to estimate the seagrass extent and distribution in Greece in the Mediterranean, and he had 72% accuracy. And based on the imagery and the water clarity, we expect to have similar results in Seychelles. And so mapping has like, oh, it's just so cool right now how much it's improved. I think it's the equity that that still lingers because in places like insular Asia where like satellites sometimes don't cover those places because no one is really living there. Like in the middle of the, in the Indian Ocean, there are so many uh, islands that are uninhabited. So it's the equity of getting those places mapped from the satellites to help improve like our global map. But, and, and I will say like seagrasses are now becoming front and center in policy discussions. And it's because of the advances in technology. We're, no, we're knowing more about seagrasses, where they are, how much, not just the extent, but distribution of species um, when there's field validation. So it's, it's, it's changing, like the seagrass landscape is changing. Awesome. And how can people get a hold of you? Where can they find you? Do you uh, what's the easiest way to get in touch? Yeah, you could send me an email at s baez, so s b a e z bravo alpha echo zebra at pewtrust.org. Awesome. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone uh, that this webinar was uh, was recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. 
Again, uh, our channel information here. Let me pull it up real fast. Uh, I got to make myself the presenter again. So, uh, well, it's at uh, at Restore Estuaries. You can find all of our information there. Uh, I can't figure out how to pull it up here real quick. So. Uh, anyway, I want to thank the 100-ish uh, or so of you that joined us today. Uh, obviously, thank you, Dr. Baez, for your time, your expertise, and your hard work in this field. Uh, I appreciate you uh, joining us and, and being a friend, not just of, of, my, of mine, but also of, of everyone working on, on this type of work across the world. Um, and we don't have a webinar uh, announcement for next month yet, but please do check in uh, in the coming weeks for updated information on that. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. And please, everybody have a safe and wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Rob. Bye, everyone.